Good Sabbath, everyone. It is a blessing to be back here with you, both here and those who are listening online. What a wonderful resurrection Sabbath we had last weekend, huh? Yes. I had lunch with uh, Brother Estor and was just telling him all that he missed <laughs> between the uh, good fellowship and the good food. Uh, we praise God not only for sending his son, but that his son Jesus Christ not only took our place and died for our sins, but praise the Lord. He rose again after the third day. Hallelujah. A great message. And it was a promise fulfilled. And without it, none of us would be saved and enjoy a restored relationship with God that was lost back in Eden. So we praise God for the fulfilling of his promise of a Messiah. Amen. Amen. Speaking of promises, does everyone here today know what a promise is? promise is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. So what about you? Have you ever been promised something that you really wanted? Maybe a job promotion or a gift of money or marriage, a new car, vacation. Think about how you anticipated that gift. Did you like that anticipation? I don't know about you, but I get a great enjoyment out of anticipation. Sometimes I confess, though, that the anticipation turned out to be just as good as the actual gift and maybe even better. And other times I find out that I was anticipating the wrong gift. You think you know what they've got you, but then when you open it up, it's something different. And sometimes, unfortunately, promises that are made are not kept. What a disappointment when that happens, huh? Well, I want to talk to you today about a promise that was made and a promise that was kept. The title of the message is The Holy Spirit, A Promise Made, and the next week will be The Holy Spirit, A Promise Kept. You see, God didn't just promise to send a Messiah. God also promised to send a part of himself to be with us, to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us, and yes, even live with inside us. What a concept. What a concept to think that God would send a portion of his spirit to live right inside you and me. That almost defies our comprehension. Not not just the how, but the why. I mean, he's God after all, and we're nothing but his created beings who have failed miserably, hence the need for the Messiah. And yet, not only did he plan to fix the broken problem, but then to put within us a portion of his spirit. We well, just stop and praise the Lord for that and be done. Amen. But he promised that to us. And uh, he promised that not only would he live in us, but that he would comfort us. In fact, that's why one of the Holy Spirit's names is the Comforter. One of the places that God promised to give us his spirit is found in Joel chapter 2, 28 through 29. Joel 2, 28 through 29. Turn there with me today, if you will, or read along on the screen here. Um, Let's read what God gave Joel to speak to us through prophecy. He says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. A lot of people want to think of the Holy Spirit as being all New Testament stuff. But here we are in what's considered the Old Testament of God saying, I'm going to pour my spirit out. And we could look farther back about when the spirit came upon David or upon the prophet. But I thought this was a great one of a promise, not just that of an, a momentary gift of the Holy Spirit coming on somebody and they prophesied or whatever. But this is God promising, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Think of that. 
You know, it's a lot different than like if you took a little dropper and gave a few drops or, or maybe sprinkled. <laughs> or spritzed. Yeah, there you go, or spritzed. But what does he say here? Pour. The connotation of pour is almost like dumping. And you just think of it. And I guess that's where, where I, in my mind's eye, again, I'm interpolating here. But in my mind's eye, when I read this, I almost saw God just like dumping the entire pitcher over on all of humanity. I'm just going to pour out my spirit. What a promise. Especially when you think of how broken we were in our relationship with God because of what happened all the way back with Adam and Eve. And God's saying, not only am I going to send a Messiah to restore that relationship, but then when I do that, I promise you, I'm going to pour my spirit all over you. You're going to get drowned in my presence. What a promise. But let's break this promise down. God promises not that any old spirit, but his spirit would be poured out on all flesh. The proof of which, if you remember what we just read, the proof of which would be that the sons and daughters of Israel would prophesy. Notice that it's not just the sons or just the daughters, but basically everyone in Israel that's a son or a daughter is going to prophesy. And Israel's young and old men would see visions and dream dreams. They would hear from God what God's will was and what was going to happen in the future. This would be the result of God pouring his spirit out. But I want you to note something else. He also states that his spirit would be poured out on Israel's men servants and maid servants. Now quite a few of those were Israelites because they had a slave system where that, you know, you could become indentured for so many years and then uh, you had to be let go and your uh, you were given enough to start out on your own, etc. But they also took in foreign slaves, foreign servants. But notice God doesn't make a distinction here. He says, I'm going to pour out my spirit even on your servants, those who are less than you. Because that's how Israel thought of their not only their servants, but especially Gentiles. And God's saying, y'all going to get it. I'm going to pour it out on everybody. Hold that thought a second. Turn over to Isaiah 44, 3 through 5. Isaiah 44, 3 through 5. God speaks through Isaiah saying, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And another will call upon the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, the Lord's and actually name himself by the name of Israel. So folks, if you read the last part of that, there are people who are actually going to call themselves Israelites who wouldn't be already. They're going to write it on their hand. They're going to name themselves. We're part of that. Because God is going to pour his spirit out. You see how he's pointing forward? He's promising what? Not only would his Holy Spirit be poured out, but he poured out on all of humankind. There are several other references, but I wanted to move on to the New Testament, but I at least wanted to touch on the Old Testament show that here was a promise made. It wasn't just a promise made by Jesus. And let's move on to what uh, happened in the New Testament. All four Gospels tell an account of John the Baptist preaching of one coming who would baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So here's John the Baptist. He's foretelling Jesus' coming, but he says when Jesus comes... He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Again, you take that pouring, and now he's going to baptizing. Well, the way they baptize then and now is they completely submerge you underwater. He's saying, look, I'm submerging you under this water, 
but he is going to submerge you. You're going to be wholly immersed in the Holy Spirit. What a promise is that? You're going to be enveloped in every crack and crevice, orifice, sight, touch, feel, everything about you. All your senses will be just consumed by the Holy Spirit. What a promise. When you think of the distance we were from God because of what happened in Adam and Eve, always he promised in the Old Testament God's going to pour out his spirit. But John the Baptist is saying when Jesus comes, you're going to be totally and wholly enveloped in the Holy Spirit. I should say completely enveloped so it doesn't create confusion. Completely enveloped in the Holy Spirit. And this promise was made to large crowds of people. We're going to assume they were primarily Jews. But the fact of the matter is, any passerby could stop and listen. The extent of what he was referring to can only be determined by reading the accounts of when it actually occurred. So we don't really know all that he meant by this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just reading this passage. But if you stay with me, this week and next week we'll find out what that meant. Next, we have Jesus and the things he had to say about the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be given to anyone who would ask the Heavenly Father. Turn to Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Anybody follow that? So if we know how to give good gifts to our children because we love them and we want them to be blessed, it's like, time out. If you can do that and you're nothing more than a recreation of God's image, how much more will the Heavenly Father gladly give you of his spirit if you just think about it no what does it say here if you ask him for it there's an application question for the end of this series have you asked God for his spirit have you asked your heavenly father for the gift of the Holy Spirit Well, I know of one dear departed sister in the Lord who did just that. She grabbed onto this verse and she knelt down at the altar at the front of her church. And she cried out, Father, I believe your word is true. So I am going to stay here at this altar until you keep your promise of the Holy Spirit being given to those who would ask. And she did too. Sister Margie stayed there three days and nights without leaving, praying nonstop, God, keep your promise. I want your Holy Spirit. Give me your Holy Spirit. Until finally, the Holy Spirit came upon her and she spoke in tongues and felt the presence of the Lord. And you know, the entire time that I knew her, I was always overcome by the power and conviction of her prayers. She had an anointing of the Holy Spirit that when she prayed, you could feel like the heavens opened and there was this face-to-face -face communication going on. And you just kind of wanted to sit back and watch, as it were, because of this connectedness she had with God. That was the gift that he gave her is this this powerful communication. She was kind of like, though, if you think about what she did, she was like that woman coming before the judge. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. God, you promised it, and I believe you're God, and therefore you cannot help but keep your promises, and so I'm going to stay here until you do keep your promise and continue in prayer, asking and asking and asking, because your word says if I ask, you'll do it. She believed God would do whatever the Bible says he would do. 
And she would call on him on his promises regularly. He'd say, now, Father, your word says this, and I believe it. So I need you to show up. Sweet spirit lady. She just said, I wanted God. I wanted God's Holy Spirit to be with me in a powerful, mighty way. I saw him do that in others. And I saw how God used them. And I wanted to have that same experience. And I refused to take no for an answer. I clung to this verse and cried out to God till he answered his prayer and kept his promise. Hallelujah. Moving on. Jesus said that the Spirit would be given as living water to all who thirst and come to him in faith. In John seven thirty seven through thirty nine, John seven thirty seven through thirty nine, we find on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, "If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water." Now, if you just listen to that part from a physical mindset, it makes no sense. Praise God, he allowed the Apostle John to explain this. He goes on to say, now this he said about the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. He's saying, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit being promised to all who believed in him. And then he goes on to give a little insight a little look ahead he says who were to receive it was coming they just didn't know it yet and he goes on to say for as yet the spirit had not been given because jesus had not yet been glorified how cool is that jesus shouts this out if anyone's thirsty let him come to me and drink for whoever believes in me just as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water if you're thirsty, come here, and I will give you to drink. And if you'll believe in me, just like the Scripture said, out of your heart will flow livers, rivers of living water. <laughs> uh, but still, think about that. There, do you see that volume of water analogy that's going on again? We've got pouring, we've got baptism, and now we've got a river coming out of you. God's consistent in his analogy of using water as an explanation for how the Holy Spirit is being promised to be given to his people. Hallelujah. And I still remember listening to Sister Margie describe her experience at the altar. And she used very similar explanations. She said not too many years earlier, there had been a great flood. She was in California. They have the landslides and all that. And the landslides just came down and came through the houses and filled them six foot high full of mud and everything else. It just consumed everything. And she said while that was wanton destruction... It felt the same way when God gave me His Holy Spirit. It wiped away all my inhibitions, all my concerns about the things I'd done in the past and everything because I was consumed, filled up with God's presence. And I really didn't think about Margie anymore. She said, all I could say was my Lord and my God because of the mightiness of His presence that was on me. She said, asking him into my heart is one thing, but then having his Holy Spirit just fully consume me, she said, I just, I almost couldn't speak. It was just this awe-inspiring uh, event in my life. And I, I just asked her about it several times because it just so intrigued me. She said, a peace and a joy washed over her while at the same time, an awe of the presence of the God Spirit. See, it's like you're feeling so many things at once. There's this peace and this joy. Oh, here's God. And at the same time going, oh, here's God. 
It was just a joy to listen to her tell of that story. Now, it's possible that this living water that Jesus was referring to here and what we just read was the same gift he was referring to when he was speaking to the woman at the well earlier in chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, instead you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He's saying, You're after... You're after this physical water, but I can give you the water of the Holy Spirit that will just supersede, transcend any physical need for water if you'd only asked. And the woman said, Sir, you don't even have anything to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus replied, everyone who drinks of the water from this well will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. For the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Do you see the consistency of the analogy here? It's also of note that the comparison of the Holy Spirit to water was a sim- just as Isaiah did in Isaiah 44, as we read earlier. There's consistency, Old and New Testament, this water analogy. Jesus also promised him as the spirit of truth who would be a helper and live with and in them. If you turn over in John to chapter 14, I know you know verse 15, but let's read today 15 through 17. Starts out, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But when you do that, he goes on to say, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you, notice the promise there, he will give you another helper to be with you forever. What a promise. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will send you a helper that will be with you and in you forever. Whew! Doesn't that give you chill bumps? God is promising this. He says, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, for it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and here's the promise, and will be in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a comfort it is to those of us who accepted the offer of salvation and forgiveness of sins to know that we have the Holy Ghost living with us and in us. What a comfort to know that it wasn't just a one-time thing, but Jesus said once that gift has been given, He will be with you forever. Praise the Lord. What a comfort to know that he's not the spirit of falsehood. He's the spirit of truth. Praise God. What a comfort to know that he's going to be with us forever. What a comfort to know he's the spirit of truth. Well, no wonder they call him the comforter. Moving on in that same chapter, in verse 26, Jesus says, But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Here's another name for him, the Helper. The Holy Spirit, the Helper. But it's also here, while it wasn't named explicitly, he was given another identity. He will teach you. How cool is it? We just learned he was the Spirit of Truth. And now we've learned that he's going to teach us. So we know that what we're going to be taught is going to be truth. He will bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit would both teach them and us, as well as bring to their remembrance all the things Jesus taught taught them. I praise the Lord that the Holy Spirit's done that in my life in times when I've been seeking his direction or when I've been in a situation where I needed guidance. He would bring to mind a scripture and it would let me know this is what I should do in that situation. He was letting them know that even though his time, that is Jesus with them, 
was coming to an end, he had a plan in the form of the person of his Holy Spirit to both teach them and help them remember all that Jesus had taught them. Again, what a comfort there. He's letting them know, I'm going to go, but I'm sending you someone to help. A comfort to know they would not have to worry about being unable to learn more about God, more about what Jesus was teaching, and a comfort to know that they wouldn't have to worry about forgetting what they'd already learned. Then in chapter 15, verses 26 through 27, Jesus says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you, again, notice that promise of the future, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father. So now he's identifying, where's this Spirit of Truth coming from? It's actually coming directly from Almighty God the Father. And when he gets to you, he will bear witness about me. He'll tell you more about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So Jesus tells the disciples that the Holy Spirit's purpose is to bear witness of Christ together with the apostles. And if you flip over another chapter in John, verses 7 through 11, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, this helper I've been telling you about in the previous verses, he won't come. I've made you this promise, but the condition of this promise is that I leave so that he can come. Then he goes on to tell something else the Holy Spirit's purpose is. If I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Oh, that we as Christians today would quit bashing people over the head with the Bible and let the Holy Spirit do His job. It's not our job to condemn and judge. It's our job to share Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. It's not our job to browbeat them into kneeling and accepting Christ as our Savior. It's our job to tell them about Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do His job. You see, our job is a far less bigger role than we think it is. Our job is a far less critical role than we think it is many times. And we use that as excuses as we talked about in Sabbath school today. We use so many excuses for why we don't evangelize as much as we should. Whenever our only opportunity is to hold the news, spiritual newspaper up and say, here's the headlines. And then back up and let God do his thing. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is promising here. When he comes, he will convict the world. He will lead people to all truth. Our job is to let them know that he's there. It's far simpler a task than we make it. But I digress. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Wow. I could go off on a whole different tangent with that one. The ruler of this world, grammar folks, is judged. Present tense. It's already happened. So not only is the Holy Spirit again promised to be sent by Jesus, but his role here, according to this passage, includes convicting people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Wow. You think about all we've read through, the Holy Spirit's the one with the big job, right? Spirit of truth, comforter, leading you into truth, bearing witness, <laughs> convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Whatever he hears, he's got to speak, guiding people into the truth, declaring things to you that are to come. So he's also a future teller. He's going to show you what God's going to do. Jesus again promises... When the spirit of truth comes. When? When he comes. So Jesus is promising. He's coming. He's coming. I'm going to go away, but he's going to come. 
The Holy Spirit is coming, people. Get ready for it, because when He comes, He will guide us into all truth, including prophecy about things yet to come. Whew. Can't wait to see what that's like. Imagine being there and they're hearing all this stuff. Amazing. Jesus finishes in verses 14 through 15. He will glorify me. There's another role. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit, being part of the Godhead, is fully aware of all that God is. And he's going to declare the things God has to each of us. And in doing so, glorify Jesus Christ, the Son of God. A promise not only of the gift of the Holy Spirit, but a promise of the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? From the Old Testament to the New, we have the promise not only of the gift of the Holy Spirit, but of the work of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. What a thing to look forward to, huh? What a promise. Jesus confirms this promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit before he ascends up to heaven in Luke 24 49. Luke 24, 49. Jesus says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He said, Okay, here it comes. I made these promises from all the way back in the beginning, through all my ministry, till now. It's coming. Put your seatbelt on. It's about here. Wait. I'm going to ascend on high. You just wait until you're clothed. Think about that analogy. Wait until you are clothed. You know, unless you're wearing a onesie, most of us, when we're clothed, we have multiple layers on. We're covered. And that's the exact analogy Jesus was saying. I'm not just sending you a little droplet. You're going to be covered In the Holy Spirit. Whew. A, it's in, incomprehensible that God would even want to do that to begin with. But then to say, not only am I going to send a part of me to be with you and in you, but he's going to blow your socks off. He's going to be in you, outside of you. You're going to be drowned in him. You're going to be clothed in him. So not only do we have this image from water and from clothing of just how consumed we'll be by his spirit, but then he goes on to say, and this is what will happen as a result of that. He'll guide you into truth. He'll comfort you. He'll convict of sin. And on and on and on and on. What a great promise God promised. Amen? Amen. And Jesus tells his disciples now, he says, believe this promise. Have faith in this promise, and here's how you do it. Stay here in Jerusalem until this gift I promised you, this gift of the Holy Spirit, comes on you. And we'll find out that they would know it, as Sister Marjorie did, as being clothed, covered up, consumed, filled, drowned in the very power of Almighty God. Hallelujah. And Luke tells the story again in Acts 1, 4 through 5. He says, And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water. Hear the correlation between him and John the Baptist. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Whew! If nothing else, his message is consistent. Therefore, when the disciples had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, there's a whole other rabbit trail about the fact they still didn't get it. But we'll not go there today. And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So, that's not important for you to know. And he goes right back to it again. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So here's something else. 
all these other attributes to the Holy Spirit, the way it's going to happen. But he also goes on to say, you are going to receive power. And we'll see that that promise was also kept as we read through next week the things that God did in keeping his promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. So again, we find this confirmation of the promise of the Holy Spirit in all these verses. And here at the end, Jesus tells them, Now wait for this promise, and you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit and receive power when it happens. Clearly, multiple passages promising this Holy Spirit being given to God's people. A promise has been made. So tune in next week to find out if and how the promise was kept. Until then, study over what you've learned today and seek God. I challenge you to seek God as Sister Marjorie did in prayer and ask Him for more of His Spirit to fill you, to pour in you, to spring out of you like a river, living water, to clothe you in His Spirit, to keep His promise of the Holy Spirit in your life. You'll be so glad you did. Amen.